I'm Jason Foster. I'm the director of Parkland Institute, and I'm pleased to be sort of chairing this last session of our first reborn conference uh, since COVID. So I, I don't know about you, but I've found the last couple of days to be quite stimulating and a combination of discouraging and hopeful, which is kind of what we were aiming for, is to depress the crap out of you, but then say, but there's a way through this. And so hopefully you all have that bit of things. So I have just a couple of things I've got to do before we get to our final speaker. I want to thank once again our sponsors, for without whom this would be a much less uh, garish affair. The main sponsors this year are the Alberta Federation of Labor, the Athabasca University Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Civic Service Union Local 52, Health Sciences Association of Alberta, the Non-Academic Staff Association at the University of Alberta, the United Nurses of Alberta, the University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts, and the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment. I also want to thank our media sponsors, Alberta Views Magazine and CJSR Radio for their support. One of the more important thank yous is to all of the volunteers um, who really, really helped make this conference work. It includes everything from the session facilitators to our setup and teardown crews, the drivers who've been kind of driving back and forth to the airport with all of our speakers, and just everybody who kind of helps kind of make this thing hum. Again, we would not be having a very successful conference if not for all of your hard work, so thank you so much. And I also want to thank Rob Butts um, in his effort um, to keep the conference website operational, which is a more challenging task than you might imagine, uh, and to Flavio Rojas, who does all of Parkland's design work and so did the design work for the conference as well. But I think probably the largest of our thank yous, as always, needs to go out to the staff of Parkland Institute, because it's them that really does make both the Institute work and this conference happen. Kayla Dixon um, was our conference coordinator this year. She joined us in August and just kind of hit the ground running and really sort of uh, was able to pull up all the details that, that, that need to happen when you're trying to organize something as like this. And Rita Espichit, who you may not have seen here much, is she's our communications coordinator, and she's been creating quite the social media and web presence for the conference over the course of the weekend. So she owes her a big thank you. And the irrepressible Charlene Oliver, our longtime administrative coordinator. She's been keeping track of all the registrations and the sales and the money and you name it. So thanks again to Char. And of course, when we talk about the staff, we can't ignore our intrepid leader, the executive director, Ricardo Acuna, who just kind of masterfully guides the team. And this is where I use the bully puppet appropriately, is to remind you all that the Parkland Institute gets no government or corporate money. The way we operate, the research that we conduct, events like this only happen from the donations of individuals and organizations that are supportive. So I would like to say if you really enjoyed this weekend, obviously we appreciate your kind words, but also if, if you have the means, um, some of your kind money um, would also be very helpful for us. Now, with all that sort of business out of the way, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Malcolm Azania, our last and final keynote speaker for the weekend. Uh, Malcolm is engaged in Afrocentric and multicultural and social justice organizing since he was a high school student in the 1980s. In addition to having been a sketch comedy writer, a video game writer, poet, high school English teacher, workshop leader, and public speaker, he's also been a radio broadcaster and producer, podcaster and national television host, and is an award-winning print journalist and award-winning novelist under the pen name Minister Faust. In this era of climate chaos and the rise of fascism, much of Azania's current work, writing, and exploration is focused on the eclectic solutions and democratic creating expansive opportunities. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Malcolm, a guy who seems to not be able to just do one thing. He has to seem to do many things. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think it's fair to say, I'm going to ask you, uh, just with a show of hands, who has perhaps felt at least slightly out of sorts or ill at ease over the last six or so years of politics? Just anybody? Yeah, OK. All right. Just thought I'd check. Just wanted to make sure everybody was you know, as awake and aware as, as the next person. So you know, we've had a few things to deal with, things. <laughs> few more things, some uh, close to home, and uh, some a little bit further from home but disturbing, some that are close to home and resemble things that are further from home, and uh, some uh, super villains, so cartoonish in their villainy that they seem like they should be out of a Superman comic, uh, are real life, unfortunately. 
But fortunately, things can actually get better. So somebody said goodbye. That was a good day. Was it a good day? Yeah. No, not yet. But, you know, it's not done yet, right? And then other people like this. When Rupert Murdoch turns on you, hey, that's a good day for us, I'd say. And then we have uh, these people, leaders of the uh, truck convoy that some journalists irresponsibly refer to as the Freedom Convoy. As a journalist, you shouldn't just take people's names for themselves. So that, for instance, if I just decided to call myself Emperor of the Universe, it would not be necessary for any journalist to quote me in the newspaper as the Emperor of the Universe. If it's not a Freedom Convoy, don't call them that. If it is a fascist convoy, that might be descriptive. You could settle on something in the middle, just like trucker convoy would do. Well, we've got a few other people like this ordered to pay billions of dollars in damages, or further damage to uh, Twitter. Um, and, you know, we're going to see uh, <laughs> what else happens in the future. It is important to remember that as trying as the last several years have been, there can be big changes. This is our premier currently, but for how long? Those of us interested in science fiction and physics know it's a unit of distance. It's the light year, how far light can travel in a year. Well, you might ask yourself, what other kinds of units could we generate? And so one is the truss term. So how long did Liz Truss last as Prime Minister of, of Britain, of Great Britain? And so the question we now have locally is, what will the Smith unit be? I think she's on her way out. Let's have a look. Here's an example of things happening that we don't expect to happen. I'm just curious, how many of you are born in Alberta? Okay, so almost all of us here, because it's Sunday and everybody else went home already. So we're Albertans, multi-generational and so forth, and we've put up with as much as we complain while we're here about what's wrong with Alberta, we don't want people from other parts of Canada complaining to us about Alberta. So it gives us, you know, great cause for celebration when we can see the latest poll results uh, this one coming uh, from uh, Janet Brown Opinion Research, reported by Elise Von Scheele, some really uh, very encouraging notes about how much Albertans can change. For instance, oil and gas, four years ago, Albertans regarded as the most important issue, only 12% now. Imagine what a drop that is in four years to go from 40% most important to only 12. So Albertans are open to things that you know, we've been told they're not open to. Now, I'm not going to read through all of these graphs, but it's worthwhile to note that if you combine the strongly agree and the somewhat agree, 62% of Albertans say that we should do more to address climate change. And combined, again, 59% say it'll be good for us to transition away from oil and gas for the economy. 60% of us do say that we believe that in 25 years, oil and gas will still be the most important part of our economy. But think about this. The real question is, what will Albertans say four years from now? And what they say four years from now depends on what we spend the next four years doing. Because we didn't expect that you know, four years ago that Albertans could change so much in their opinion of the primacy of oil and gas. And we have been making our own changes, organizations such as Parkland Institute, many people doing independent journalism, podcasters, community activists, environmentalists, everyday folks in their communities learning and seeing what is possible and how to make a better world, a better Canada, a better Alberta. So what I'm saying to you is stay the course. Keep doing the things that you've been doing. If you can, do more. If you can donate a few bucks to Parkland, please do. But the point is we can make changes We've gotten through a terrible time. It was looking particularly bad, but we're turning a corner. So I'd like to talk to you today about the strategies, the tactics, the tools, the paths, and the means that are available to us, and I'd like to talk about five of them. I'm going to be talking to you about the importance of understanding the distinction between allyship and alliances. I want to talk about what is strategic intercommunalism. This is a strategic note. How do we build connections among a vast range of communities to build an active, politically powerful, progressive movement whose thinkers, speakers, and organizers don't just look like the population, but are from that population and responsible to that population? The third is tactical, pro-social competition. 
with low to moderate resources, how can we activate the largest number of people possible to address crucial, long-standing, or emergent problems and build high-value opportunities? In other words, how can we fight an asymmetric battle against billionaires? How can we punch above our own weight? We'll look at digital frontiers for organizing. Uh, that's featuring a few startling case studies from one, two, and three. And finally, we're going to look at an Alberta Solidarity Fund based on a real case study from Quebec. That's an example of a resource intensive, but a maximum impact mechanism to give us the kind of power that generally only belongs to plutocrats such as the Koch brothers. It's the means to change the long game, and it arises from workers owning more and more of the means of production. And at the end, there will be some homework. Let's have a look at alliances as opposed to allyship. Some of you may remember, I think this first started to appear around 2016, we saw some people who were putting safety pins on their clothing, and it was supposed to symbolize that they were ready to help out somebody who was being menaced by some type of right-wing monster. The question is, hey, you know, isn't that nice, somebody saying they're willing to help? I mean, the word safety is right in the name of a safety pin, so this person must be reliable. But the question, of course, has to be which problems is the person wearing this pin actually able to solve? I mean, if a proud boy is beating you, will the person wearing the safety pin rush up and repeatedly prick the assaulting proud boy in his tiny little intellect to try to get that person to leave you alone? The problem with these kinds of symbols, or the word ally, is that it's self-chosen. You don't have to train. There are no guarantees that come with it. So it is a display rather than proof or a guarantee. Some people, of course, capitalized on it. They thought, hey, why, why use a one penny safety pin when I could sell you a $10 one from Etsy? There's always people willing to make a buck off of something that is supposed to be progressive. But it is magenta and it does look cute. So these kinds of things are worse than participation ribbons. Now that's because if you get a participation ribbon, you actually did participate. You know, you didn't, you, right? you didn't win, but you were there, you showed up, you did something. Maybe you could win next time, but at least you were there. But second, because it comes without any guarantee of the ability to help. It's a very quiet, hard to spot declaration of an intention to be seen as someone who will help. It's like a tiny metal diary that you leave open, hoping that somebody will read it and know how good you are. So there's a problem if people are really, really desirous of giving themselves the label of hero. Why? Why is that a problem? I think most of you will remember at least one of these men. These are men who went out of their way to position themselves uh, as feminists, as, as, as that thing called the male feminist, and they wanted to make sure as many people as possible knew about it. Now, in some cases, they didn't all use the expression male feminist, but they positioned themselves in popular culture and the causes they associated themselves with and the commentaries they made. And then what we discovered, in fact, was that their behavior was 100% at odds with the image that they had cultivated. So the label was a con. Your actions are your true ideology. Doesn't matter what you say, what you do is what actually counts. Now this kind of creation of images that are designed to tell us something about somebody or broadcast, in this case, to the young men in the audience who you could be, they are trying to suggest that well, one person is a hero. And you'll notice that in these kinds of images, which you know, those of us in this gen our generation, Generation X, grew up with these images on pinball games and album covers and movies and comic books and magazines, they say that but in this case, the man is the hero, and these women have to be protected. And in fact, they're not just to be protected, they're supposed to be prizes. They are supposed to be the prize for having done the heroic deed. So if you just do this thing, young man who's 13 years old and knows nothing about anything, this will be your reward. And of course, some of those 13-year-old boys never actually grew up, and now they're in government or in media. <laughs> Now these images continue, those images I just showed you were older ones, but as much as I love uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, they still, in their movie posters at least, not so much their actual movies or TV shows, She-Hulk is a great show, it's an excellent feminist show, it's wonderful, I encourage you to watch it. Nevertheless, 
uh, on their advertising, you continue to see these sorts of images. Sometimes these are called uh, cling images. So the woman is clinging to the side of the man, or in some cases actually is lowered so that she's literally clinging to his leg, sitting like a dog at his feet, uh, a truly degrading portrait. But they don't have to be all that format. They can be images like these that say that, you know, they can be the, the European hero who rushes to the rescue of those poor uh, darkies who are living in misery. Whether that's in their own misery or the misery imposed by colonialists, that's the meaning. These images say, hey, you could be like them. You could be a protector. You could be great. Sometimes these labels, images, and icons imply that these self-declared allies or self-declared heroes love your culture. They love it so much that they want to say that they're part of your culture, regardless of whether you agree to that. And they will even go so far in some cases as to try to replace you in your own culture so that they can become your king. And that's what these movies are about. Also, in real life, some of you who remember uh, Rachel Dolezal, uh, a not an African-American, who masqueraded as one and actually became a local NAACP or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People chapter head and got access to money and jobs and grants and all kinds of things. In the case of Canada, author Joseph Boyden, who had positioned himself as an indigenous man and writer and award-winning author and so forth, who was in fact not indigenous, Kerry Borassa, professor uh, at Saskatchewan University, one of Canada's top health experts, who went by also the name of Morning Star Bear, who uh, some exposés demonstrated was in fact not indigenous. So the allure for many people of being named as an ally or a hero is intense, so the desire to declare oneself an ally has major psychological rewards. <laughs> Here's a, a blog post or part of a blog post from a uh, woman. She didn't call herself an ally. She used the old-fashioned word for ally, which was missionary. Okay. She had gone to Kenya. I'm not making this up. She had been hoping to find, quote, dirt floors, dirty laundry hanging everywhere, kids half naked and covered in bug bites, people who couldn't speak English. Instead, she had found a beautiful Nairobi, because she went to Kenya, the or was the capital city, a beautiful Nairobi shopping mall with plenty of merchandise and security, and again, in her own words, a hub for international business, a place where new buildings are being built left and right. But this girl from the States expected Nairobi to be what, like what you see in the movies or on Feed the Children commercials. The question is, when you see this instead of starvation, why would you be sad? Shouldn't you be happy? Mission accomplished. Get up a banner. We did it. Even though we didn't do it, they did it. But you should be happy. Less suffering in the world. So the question is, why are you really there? In this documentary, uh, have any of you listened to this documentary, The White Saviors from Canada Land? Yeah, I strongly recommend it. By the way, all of the uh, citations for today's talk are on my website. And so I'll put up the URL at the end. But also, it's, not, it's on the, the Parkland website. For the conference, it should have a link, and so you can get all these, and just so you can check out all this content yourself. The Canada Land White Saviors Expose on the WE organization gave one of the best examples ever of the mindset we've just heard described, uh, this time coming from an affluent Euro-American voluntourist whose name, and I am not making up this name, was Pippa Biddle. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's nice to make fun of people's names, it's just that if I wrote that into a sketch, for sketch comedy, somebody would say, That's a, you're laying it on awfully thick. Nobody's really named that. In a genuinely insightful post-missionary confession, Pippa Biddle explained that she had become a WE volunteerist. WE was a Canadian and is a Canadian organization. It's mostly defunct in Canada, but is still flourishing elsewhere in the world. And if you listen to this podcast, you will see why that is a tragedy. She had become a WE volunteerist because like her affluent Euro-American peers, she had sought a photograph of herself holding an unnamed African child in an unnamed African country as proof of her own saintliness. This is what she said. We all really wanted the photo sitting next to the really beautiful black orphan. And that's the reality of what we wanted. And there's social capital that comes with being the person in that photo, being the white person in that photo, especially as you're preparing to apply for college. If you could write about how you went to Africa and, like, learned something about yourself while also saving orphans, 
like that was the essay to write. It's really hard to explain the euphoria that you get from visual evidence of things that you think were good. Having a photo to look back on and think, wow, that moment, I was happy, and the child looks happy, and I created that happiness? And so you become sort of addicted to creating those artifacts and creating that material, and then especially with the boom of Instagram, sharing it with other people and getting affirmation from other people, and those are just additional dopamine hits over and over and over again. Everything in your brain is telling you, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, and so why would you ever stop doing that? Now, I want to be fair to Pippa Biddle, you know, she said this in the podcast, and she was not saying that was good. She was recognizing. She had grown. She had changed. She had learned that what she had done was not a good thing. Sometimes, people on any part of the political spectrum, or from any religious or secular community, can just want to nail people to the mistakes that they've made, instead of saying, have you changed? Have you grown up? Are you doing better now? So I don't raise this young lady's name so that we can hop online and try to harass her. But we should also remember, in one way or another, probably everybody in this room has been Pippa Biddle at one time or another. We've got to give people some credit for learning from their mistakes. When you realize that some people have been determined to cast themselves as heroes, then you become aware of some of the things they do that really they should not be doing, that they are doing in the service of their own ego. There is a uh, student organization at the University of Alberta called Students Against Global Apathy. And I'd like to show you one of their t-shirts that they still sell. Now imagine if a group of self-declared male feminists released a t-shirt like this that said, women need more love. Now we would all know that they were monsters. Unfortunately, in this case, fitting the colonial paradigm, this is okay to say an utterly degrading image in every conceivable way. If uh, you want to politely suggest to Saga that they should stop selling the shirt, uh, that, that would be, and I emphasize politely, that would be fine. I did suggest that to them more than 10 years ago. They did not take my advice. All right, the lesson from this. You can stay big only if you keep someone else small. You can be above only if someone else is below. You can be at the center only if you push everyone else out of the way. So remember, if you want to do better, pity is not respect, and saviorism is not solidarity. Other people want what you want, to get the respect they've earned, to achieve excellence, and to advance accordingly. So let's look at how to make actual alliances rather than to dwell in allyship. These are the most famous allies in history. They're so famous they don't need any, you know, description. They're the allies, like Madonna. They're not heroes. Uh, these men were all guilty of absolutely terrible crimes. Um, but they were not in this alliance uh, for public relations purposes. They were in it because they were in a life and death struggle. They didn't declare themselves to be allies. They had to negotiate an alliance in a completely clear set of terms. So an allyship is informal, it's self-declared. There's nobody to vet whether it makes any sense. You just walk up to somebody and say, I'm an ally, or you post it on Instagram. It's meaningless. An alliance is formal, it's negotiated. All parties agree to participate. No one can foist their allyship on you. By the way, allyship, George Orwell taught us to beware of, of new expressions. And so it's not that new expressions are always useless. Sometimes they're really helpful. If they are helpful, keep using them. But if they are misleading, if they cover things that are not true, then it's time to stop using those terms. Allyship, vague rules. Whereas, absolutely clear rules in an alliance. You know what you're getting. You know what happens if you break the rules. In allyship, the sponsor has power over the recipient, or what I prefer to call the target. I remember hearing a discussion, was, there are a lot of very lucrative online workshops that you can book on allyship, how to be a good ally, blah, blah, blah. People pay hundreds of dollars for these online and much more in person. It's quite remarkable. There's a monetary interest in this line of thinking as well. One of those workshops that I heard about described two people in this so-called allyship. Now, the two people in a friendship are a friend and a friend, right? Not a friend and a junior partner, right? In a marriage, spouse and spouse, not a spouse and a child. That's terrible. In allyship, shouldn't it be ally and ally? No, the description being used in this video was an ally and a partner. So already that means that those two things don't go together. 
your two allies. You can each help each other. Now, of course, this is just one of the many descriptions that exists online, but in that particular one, that was a flag. Allies have power over each other, and this is critical. If the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union didn't meet the terms of their alliance, then they would stop helping each, whatever, whoever broke the alliance would suffer the consequences. In an alliance, if you don't have power over the person, they can just withdraw their sponsorship at any time. So there's no point in calling uh, an alliance where there's no power over you uh, an alliance. It's not one. And if you don't have power over the other party. Uh, allyship is transactional. The sponsor unilaterally declares what to donate to the target. And the sponsor gets prestige, but the target may not receive adequate help, or it might be counterproductive, or it might be no help at all. Now, in the case of uh, an alliance, it is also transactional. Of course it is, because all relationships are transactions. By their very nature, you get something. In a friendship, that would be love and kindness and support and fun. What's the transaction present in an alliance? Well, you decide which goods and services you want, and you work out that deal. And if you were actually working in social justice, then you would have to figure out, well, what is the useful exchange? Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't times that you can't just donate stuff. Of course you can. And I know there's a slogan I've heard from some people, solidarity is not charity. And I would say that, well, if you are really in need of food this month and somebody gives you some food, you're not in an alliance, but damn, that food is really important. So don't get me wrong here. There are times to donate things, and probably everybody in this room has donated things, some of us monthly, and I continue to, and I hope that you will continue to. We just shouldn't confuse that with an alliance. Once again, in the case of uh, allyship, the sponsor can withdraw at any time without penalty, except possibly for reputational damage, which might not actually happen. And in the case of an alliance, you can't withdraw from the alliance without suffering serious consequences. How does this work? Um, if you wanted to unionize a group of, of workers from a given ethnocultural community, meaning that you want them to give their money to you, their union dues, and to take risks for joining your organization, First, you want to think, what can you do for that community? So you might be saying, like, well, we're unionizing them. That is the reward. Well, you know, maybe, sometimes, not all the time. But what is your offer of good faith to begin with? How can you demonstrate your value in such a way that you would encourage members of that community on a volunteer basis to start to try to extend your network and help you to organize? I mean, then you are, it's a in-kind trade. So that is an exchange, a mutually beneficial exchange. So if you have a union hall, can this organization, can this cultural organization use your space? If you have a communications department in your union, can you help to magnify the activities and the uh, work that that organization is doing as long as their work is aligning with your values. That's what an alliance would be. You don't just do something because somebody tells you to. You agree, we will do this, we won't do that. That's how an alliance should function. By the way, you could also help with lobbying. Uh, you could uh, also offer courses, leadership, public speaking, any number of things that your union has the ability to deliver on. You could demonstrate not only that the union is making advances for workers from that community against racist, sexist, and similar barriers inside the unionized workplace, but inside the union staff and structure itself. Because, of course, unions represent uh, the culture that they come from. If you have a union, you want to make sure that it is living up to the claims it's making about social justice. And you can see that reflected in who they hire, who they promote, how long they retain people, who they punish, and who they fire. Moving on to strategic intercommunalism. So that means connecting and organizing strategically, by which I mean towards victory, with people from a wide range of communities. Could be ethnocultural, religious, sexual identities, and more. The reason to negotiate an alliance is because it's easier to win with it than without it. I think that's the only reason. That's why you do it. Otherwise, you would do it yourself. You would just accomplish your goals yourself. You can't win, or it'll be very tough to win without it. If you are thinking, am I in an alliance with somebody? Ask yourself, do you need this potential ally to win? And if the answer is no, well, then that's not an alliance. And that's fine. Again, as I say, there are times you just want to donate stuff, and it's useful, and it's helpful. Great. But it's not an alliance. You lose if you don't have allies, that's when you know it's actually meaningful. If you have the presupposition that a group of people from a certain community are too weak or backward or disorganized to help you in your victory, 
then yeah, you will never seek a real alliance with them. You'll just want to put yourself in a position of sponsorship. But when you actually get to know people, you will consistently find that the longer you get to know people, or at least know their communities, the more you will be connected with brilliant, innovative, remarkable people who've accomplished a great deal, and in many cases accomplished far more than you may have, or your organization may have. That's not you know, me trying to foist you know, guilt on anybody from any male guilt, white guilt, straight guilt, whatever. That's, no, that's not what I mean. I just mean that when you're actually opening to recognizing that other people can be awesome, sometimes you'll realize, like, I might not be as awesome in the same way as that person. And that's good, because now you've got a chance to grow, and you've got a chance to get better, and to do better work. So that's a good thing to seek, but not in a falsely modest way. So, the real world value. I want to give you examples of uh, what it means when you start to examine how, uh, when you actually examine what other people can do and you learn about them, things that can change. Now, when we talk about real world value, the simplest unit of measurement that I can give you is going to be in dollars. Because a lot of other things are hard to measure, how much justice, how much fairness, that may not be easy. But I want to look at some dollar cases because that also translates into what communities and workers and so forth can actually gain and how they can transform their lives materially. The makeup industry. Major corporations, L'Oreal, Revlon, Olay, Mac, and so forth, worth far more than the inflated purchase price of Twitter. They earned about $49.2 billion US in 2020. Many people will tell you, in fact, it's a truism for some people, that the only color that business people care about is green. Uh, but is that actually true? All right, these companies create their annual building, billions of dollars by communicating with one demographic, about one-sixth of humanity, so a minority while ignoring the range of skin tones that the other five-sixths of humanity has. Not everybody ignored them. Rihanna, who was not a uh, chemist, she wasn't, uh, this wasn't her, her, her professional background, she was an entertainer, she thought, hey, I can't get the products that I want, maybe I should just sell them myself. It worked out for her. Her company, Fenty, was valued at $2.8 billion. I'm not here trying to push big businesses and capitalism and, biz and billionaires on you. I'm making a point about what happens when you actually look that other people have ideas and strengths and uh, strategies that you may not have and it's time to learn from them. And that's what alliances are based on is actual strategic value. If we look at this example, Hollywood, a major study from McKinsey and Company about the US film and TV industry demonstrated that Hollywood was grossly undervaluing African themed and African directed and produced and starred projects. In fact, uh, it had a very steep financial cost to Hollywood, and that was $10 billion every single year. So they lost money. Evidently, they, green wasn't the color that they cared about. In fact, in the case of uh, this movie, Black Panther, uh, Ike Perlmutter, who was the head of Marvel Entertainment at that time, not Kevin Feige, uh, he had blocked this making of this film for years. Also, Ms. Marvel. Uh, he also gave a million dollars to Donald Trump in 2016. So he cost his own company billions of dollars. Fortunately, Kevin Feige knew better. Then there's uh, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, Sudanese telecom genius. Uh, he had at one time been a member of the Sudanese Communist Party. And he knew in the 1990s that uh, things needed to change for telephony across the African continent. Uh, at that time, landlines were very expensive. They were uh, rarely available in many countries, countries with millions and millions of people. And Ibrahim worked for British Telecom and helped to expand, to create their very first cellular network. So with his advanced knowledge and skill, he said, I need to go to my own home country to extend telephony, which is absolutely linked to increased economic performance, which means jobs for everyday people. It's uh, a great way to integrate a society for better academic uh, and governance purposes. It's absolutely necessary to have telephony, and it's cheaper to build mobile telephone transmitters than it is to build landlines. So he went to other people that he knew who had money, potential investors. He said, hey, would you please back this venture of mine? And they said, no, we can't do that. Uh, he said, look, this is good for you. Uganda is giving away the licenses. You pay millions for these or more in, in any European country. You get them for free in Uganda just for creating the service. And one of these rich men said to him, you're crazy. I can't go to Uganda with that crazy dictator Idi Amin. And Mo Ibrahim said, Idi Amin was out of office 14 years ago. <laughs> so the man said to him, well, see, you just proved my point. I'm the most sophisticated person on my board. And if I didn't know that, I guarantee you they won't. They'll never back you. Well, he eventually found enough investors. 
He built his company, Celtel. They expanded mobile telephony across the continent. By the time that he sold his company, there were 127 million cell phone users across the continent. By 2012, that number was, not just with his company, but others, that number was uh, 650 million. And now some countries, like Kenya, have um, 104%, which means some people have more than one SIM card. So the expansion has worked uh, great, and I'm going to tell you more about that in a moment. But he sold his company for $3.4 billion. So those investors who could have made money made nothing. And then, who did he sell it to? Sold it to Zane, which was a Kuwaiti company. Kuwa and then Zane sold it to Barty Enterprises, an Indian company, for $10.7 billion. So those same investors who were too blind lost twice. Literally, they lost billions. I am talking about business and money, so some people are thinking, hey, we're leftists. This doesn't matter to us. This is irrelevant. You're just pushing capitalist values on us. But think about this. If capitalists who sole goal is to make money most of the time, except for when they block Black Panther and Ms. Marvel, if their sole goal is to make money, if they missed the billions and billions of dollars lying on the table in front of them, ask yourself, is your organization doing much better? Is your organization missing opportunities? to expand justice, to create opportunities, to make people's lives better, because you don't know the people who have the expertise who can do that. And again, if you think that I'm talking about your specific identity, I'm talking about everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. If I you know, was a Kenyan Canadian, I'm in a Kenyan Canadian organization, and half the board isn't female, and there's no queer people on the board, and we don't have youth who are actively involved in making decisions, and on and people who are disabled. If we are not constantly seeking people who have been ignored, or those of you who know the reference, the, uh, the forgotten stones that the builder will use to make his temple, if we don't seek those people, then we are missing out on all of the value and the opportunity to make a better world now rather than 100 years from now, if we can last that long. Okay, so how do you make real connections? How do you make your organization reflect the real Canada? Well, we can't do it tokenistically. If you just hire somebody, particularly into a leadership position, you grab somebody and you helicopter them in, all right, you drop them. I mean, we know how dropping people from helicopters ends right, terribly. You can't just put people into a leadership position in an organization where they don't know the culture and they don't know the, uh, the rules and expect that person to thrive. In fact, it's, it's absolutely predictable that this person will not be able to accomplish all their tasks. So one of the most obvious ways is you hire people so that they are in staff positions, so that they can learn an organization's culture, and you can mentor them, and they, as they grow more and grow with the organization, they're in a position to make necessary change, to add real innovation, and to improve things. But it doesn't work if you do it tokenistically. A small example, um, you know, a lot of important decisions are made in informal venues. People, I mean, the old cliche is the golf business meeting, and all the scenes that were in Mad Men, uh, all of the decisions made over drinks. Well, I, you know, I knew of an organization where a lot of the decisions were being made over drinks with a very small number of people, but, you know, theoretically anybody could join. But in contemporary Edmonton, I mean, Edmonton has the third largest Somali community in North America, after Minnesota and uh, Toronto. If everything is being decided over drinks, and you've got a, a, an ethno-cultural religious community that is almost 99% percent is Muslim and most of those folks don't drink, and not to mention all of the other people from various other backgrounds, as well as people who've decided they can't drink because they, they have an addiction. You've ruled all of those people out of the decision making. They cannot be part of the process. And if those people predominantly fall into certain ethnocultural groups, then by function it is racist and Islamophobic. So it is critical to ask yourself, are we creating an environment where people can participate fairly? I mean, for instance, if you say, hey, look, we can have all the meetings you want in my hot tub. <laughs> I mean, you know, you made the offer. That was nice of you. But you know that most people do not want to go to your hot tub, and for good reason. So you're, keeping, you're guaranteeing that they will not be part of the solution. You have to recognize when you're doing wrong, and that doesn't mean that you're damned for all time. It just means that you now have the opportunity to do much better. When you hire, you can't just have what, you know, in African-American culture is called the fly in the buttermilk. You can't just be the one person in the room from a given equity-seeking community because, you know, when you are that one person, it is very difficult to be able to make suggestions, especially ones that may uh, cause some controversy, because you're automatically isolated. You're the newest, and you are the most distinct. 
So if you aren't hiring lots of people from lots of backgrounds, then you're guaranteeing that even when you can point to this one tokenistic hire, that person will not be able to do anything and might not even stop your company from doing like truly disastrous things in company, union, or other organization. Study after study, this one that again is on the links, uh, show that uh, corporate anti-bias training doesn't work. So-called anti-racism doesn't work. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, one of them is that um, a lot of it is actually rooted in uh, managers getting to check off boxes. It's not based on anything authentic. It's like, oh, well, we did this, this, and this. And you know, a lot of these companies that are doing the anti-racist training are owned and run exclusively by Euro-Canadians and Euro-Americans. So even on their own hiring basis, they're demonstrating like there is no equal economic opportunity in our organization. So that's not really a great sign. This remarkable man, Seth Stevens Davidovitz, he wrote a terrific uh, book, Everybody Lies. It's a great example about why anti-racism doesn't work. And I believe that this is the most definitive case. Former US President Barack Obama was giving a talk after a, a terrible uh, mass shooting event. It was uh, Muslim extremists in the United States who had done it. And so Obama went on television, tried to convince people don't basically don't be Islamophobic. Don't hate Muslims and don't hate people who you know are Arabs who might not be Muslims at all. They might be Christians or atheists, but don't hate them. And the result was a massive number because this guy was a Google data scientist. He could see the search results. Massive increase in what I call hate searches. So hate searches that combine words with Muslim, with terrorist, bad, violent, evil, that sort of thing. Even more poison into the well, US hate searches about Syrian refugees surged 60%, while help searches plunged by 35%. And while nearly every pro-Muslim search plummeted, nearly every anti-Muslim search skyrocketed. So searches for the keywords kill Muslims tripled uh, after uh, Obama's speech and during, because he could monitor these things in real time. It's terrible. So when you try to tell people, don't think this, don't say that, don't believe that, don't hate those people, it accomplishes the opposite. So uh, Davidovitz believed that uh, the White House must have gotten access to his research because he published a paper. And so uh, Obama went on to give another speech. And you know, given that uh, you can't accuse somebody of being a Muslim as if being a Muslim were bad, but, but he was frequently called a Muslim in an attempt to defame him. And you'd think, well, where's the last place that this guy is wanna, gonna wanna give a speech? You know, he'd never ever wanna be associated with, he went to a mosque and he gave a speech. It's one of the few things I'll give him a compliment for. He went to the mosque, he gave a speech, and in this speech he did the opposite. He didn't tell people not to hate. He instead just started talking about Muslim Americans who had done great things, who were your local firefighter and the doctor, and who were athletes and, you know, Americans care about soldiers. They were soldiers, and on and on it went. And the result was very encouraging. It was a huge searches that were pro-social. People wanting to learn about Muslims who had done good things and wanting to learn about Thomas Jefferson's Quran and so forth. So when you emphasize the thing that you want, you can have a measured difference by the world's most sophisticated search engine for bridging people who previously had been uh, enemies or thought of themselves as enemies. You can't erase racism. But in the educational system, you can overwrite it with better ideas and in media as well. So for instance, instead of having anti-racism stuff, so-called anti-blackness, blah, 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 why not have Afrocentric education that examines 5,000 years of African civilizations and geniuses in every field that have changed the world? Simple examples uh, that demonstrate what happens when you learn about the excellence, the brilliance of other people or what they have to offer, or you capitalize upon that knowledge is Rihanna's Fenty, The Hollywood Case, and Mo Ibrahim's company, Celtel. So beyond um, recruiting and, and hiring and mentoring and promoting inside your organization, how do you build connections so that you can create alliances towards victory? And there's lots of ways, but one of the things that we should keep in mind is we actually need to get people to create their own charters, or in the language of the Black Panther Party, 10-point platform. I'm not talking about the silly corporate thing that a lot of us experienced in the 1990s where we had to come up with a mission statement in our unit or wherever we were working, which were really a grand waste of time. I'm talking about actually being very, very clear about what are, are the main things that our organization stands for, our values, what we want, and how we plan to achieve them. What are our skills? Those vision statements things never had, at least in my experience, they never actually said, here's what we're good at and here's how we're gonna contribute to that mission. As each organization, can do this, and as you can maybe bring people together in a conference to share these things, then they can create their own Venn diagram 
that will show you what you have in common. And that gives you an opportunity to say, we can work together on this. We can ally on this specific task. That is one of the ways that you can build connections among people from various communities. Yes, there are the old cliches about how you do need to actually engage people. You need to go to, you know, go to their restaurants. You need to go to the cultural events. You might, if you don't have any connections, you're going to feel weird doing that. But, and you also don't want to walk up to somebody from some given group that's not your group and say, will you be my friend? You know, you know that's awful. Uh, you can't collect all 12. But... You can if you go to various places and you're open to the idea that you could actually connect with people on the things that you have in common. Like, I love science fiction, so I can talk to anybody from any background who likes science fiction. I'm ready to do that. At least I could have that conversation. So you don't have a phony connection, a tokenistic one, but you find the things you have in common and when you can work together that you do. But you definitely do need organizationally to see where do our interests align. This is a, a tactical discussion, pro-social competition. How do we fight an asymmetric battle with minimal resources to activate people who can solve problems and create opportunity? Now, on the left, a lot of us have always thought that competition is, is just bad. I mean, that, after all, the, the, the bad guys love to talk about competition, so it must be bad. If they love it, it must be awful. If competition is going to make things bad, I'm going to say that's because it's designed in a way to make things bad. Well, let's find out if that's an automatic feature of all competition. So what would be the conditions that would make it bad? It's unequal. There's no equal access to join the competition. You don't stand a chance because there are unequal conditions for the competitors. Some people are under-resourced. There's not an equal distribution of the rewards. So some people get very little and other people get an awful lot. Let's look at a, what I call an anti-competition credo. That's uh, decades old from a very influential thinker. I have a right to exist. I'm of high value to myself. I have a right to honor my needs and wants. I'm lovable, I'm admirable, I deserve to be treated with respect by everyone, I am worthy of happiness. My happiness and self-realization are noble purposes. You might be wondering, well, who wrote this? If you're my age, you remember Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. You know, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, I can't remember the last part. But this didn't come from a sketch comedy character, and it did not come from a leftist, although you could read that list and you could just imagine the right-wingers who would call you a snowflake and say, this is what you people want and believe. So who did actually write this? Third from the right, that's Nathaniel Brandon, age 24. Most of you, I hope, don't know his name, but you do know who that is. That's Ayn Rand, all right? Now, that's his bride. Within one year, that's his girlfriend. These are the ethicists, the uh, objective people who have the noblest values. So Nathaniel Brandon uh, has been called, because of his work, the father of the self-esteem movement. That's the movement that right-wingers like to blame on left-wingers. Brandon authored the books The Psychology of Self-Esteem in 1969 and The Pil Six Pillars of Self-Esteem in 1994. If you don't know about objectivism, get something for your stomach, read up. But it is a toxic right-wing ideology that actually proclaims the words selfishness is a virtue. It's also one of the most influential philosophies, if you could call it that, in the United States. Paul Ryan, former speaker of the US uh, Congress, was an ardent uh, objectivist, loved Ayn Rand, which is really bizarre because he was also a right-wing fundamentalist Catholic, I believe. And uh, Ayn Rand was absolutely anti-religion, like in the most, not, not as an atheist, but as an anti-theist. This kind of list, credo against competition, it is not our values. It comes from people who are against our values. And if you think about this, this is not a, a statement for, for competition. This is like, you just deserve stuff. It's yours. You, you, it, it's a statement of absolute entitlement. Like, for instance, that you deserve a claim if you're a person who says that you're the best at business, but you've gone bankrupt multiple times or that you're the least racist person that you'll ever meet, but you are the lightning rod for Nazis worldwide, or that you have won an election that you obviously lost after a month's long psyop of saying that the election would be rigged. So th this is the kind of mindset that goes with this credo against competition. If you know the office, then you'll recognize this. Okay, so right-wingers claim that competition is always good. That's what they say. And when they get extremely right-wing to the point of Nazism, you'd think they'd be extremely competitive, but in fact, it's the opposite. Because if you want to commit genocide, you're clearly saying that uh, other people should not be allowed to compete in any way possible. And all of the social restrictions that they place are always designed to keep people who can do things from doing those things. I'm not suggesting that all right-wingers are, are Nazis. I am now just talking about uh, ultra-conservatives, but the gaslighting is constant. So if they say that they are against something, they're probably doing it. And if they say they hate something, it might be something that you actually need. Just this is one example with their truck convoys, right? In their upside-down world, social justice is oppression. 
they say that the real fascism is anti-fascism. They love to uh, say that they support the troops when what they really mean is they want a war in a country they'd never heard of until five minutes ago. They say that they want free speech, but they actually want hate speech. They say they wanted a freedom convoy to have the freedom to infect people with a totally preventable disease. It's killed seven million people and infected 600 million. And they say they love the police, but then they, some of them went to the Coots border crossing with the plan to murder police. So what I'm saying is that if they say they are against something, Think again. Maybe it's something we should look into. First Nations farmers, for instance. The colonial lie is that they were terrible. Even after all the genocide and oppression they faced, that they couldn't farm, that they were somehow yesterday's people who would just die off naturally. It turns out First Nations farmers were so good and so effective at farming that the Canadian colonial government put in rules to ban them from getting mechanized equipment. They were forbidden from using anything but handmade tools. They couldn't get loans and all kinds of other uh, opportunities that would have allowed them to, I mean, they, these people were saying, you know what, Canada, uh, you know, the colonial, I'm going to participate anyway. You should be happy. This is what you say you want. But instead, they were thwarted. Women in factories across North America who uh, were crucial in the fight against fascism by creating the industrial output that was necessary to win the battle, the second that the men came home, these women were fired because they couldn't be allowed to compete for the very jobs that had allegedly saved North America and Europe. In the United States, despite the transatlantic genocide and centuries of a continent-wide rape gulag that had denied all of the West and Central Africans there all of the value of their labor for centuries and intergenerationally, of course, some communities thrived. This is Tulsa, a so-called Black Wall Street. The anti-competitive people did this. They waged a massacre or a pogrom in which they destroyed the people who were excellent at doing the very things that allegedly you're supposed to want to do if you're a true American. Uh, some of you saw this dramatized in the HBO series Watchmen. Pogroms, whether they're in Russia or in the United States or elsewhere, they're always anti-competitive. The goal is to eliminate people or terrify them into not being able to produce the value that is actually good for everybody. Uh, there were other cases, Rosewood being another one, also made into a movie. So just between 1929 and 1969, according to one study by a journalist named Sean Gonzalez, African Americans lost $1.6 trillion in collective wealth. That's 40 years in the 20th century. So what I'm saying again is these oppressive systems are always anti-competitive. So that's one of the reasons I'm pushing competition right now is because competition is actually beneficial. We've just been lied to, so we wouldn't look to it as a useful tool. When could it drive a net benefit for us all? If you have one product, one service, if you're an NGO and you've got a small budget to do one thing and you get one supplier, you're going to get one result and it might be unsatisfying. But if you get a whole bunch of people who are competing to provide results, you may get a wide range of results. Corporate contests are bad news because corporations run a contest and then you sign away all your rights to whatever you produce in your entry so that you come up with something great. If, even if you don't win, it's not yours anymore. And if you do win, it's still not yours, and you're probably not going to be compensated properly. But pro-social competitions can actually allow all of the competitors to own their own results. Because the purpose isn't for you as an NGO to own whatever they produce. It's you name a task that society needs solving, you put up a prize purse, and you encourage people to compete. And then you get a huge range of solutions, one you never predicted. And then all those people own their work. They can sell it. They can trade it. They can give it away. They can enact it. You can finance it. But you are generating real results. So there's some key models for this. The X Prize. Just curious, has anybody here heard of the X Prize? OK, so it's a massive international competition. And yes, it's easy to say, like, oh, well, it's associated with a billionaire, so it must be bad. But let's just look and see if the model works and decide how we could adapt it for our own purposes. That's Peter Diamandis, chair of the X Prize. You can read about it in this book, Abundance. These prizes, they incentivize innovation. Let's have a look. You need to have vision. I could talk about these at great length, but just for time, I'll just say, let's look at some historic prizes that have worked. This is not a pipe dream. There was the Longitude Prize. Essentially, this was offered in 1714. British Parliament wanted ships to be able to navigate and know what longitude they were while they were at sea. Essentially, it was an attempt to create the very first GPS, and uh, it worked. Now, let's be clear here. Uh, the British Navy and merchants having the opportunity to cross the world unleashed unspeakable evil. So I'm not in any way suggesting that just because you come up with a technical innovation that it's going to lead to nothing but goodness. But that would also be missing the point because everybody who is here who is not indigenous got here somehow and that is because of navigation. 
So if you're happy you're here, thank the Longitude Prize. Uh, in the case of uh, Napoleon, obviously evil despot, warmonger, to make sure his invasion of Russia could work, he needed to be able to supply food to his troops. Now, yes, they committed unspeakable crimes, not defending Napoleon. But somebody won the prize. It took a long time. Fifteen years later, Nicholas Apert invented canning, which we still use to this very day. Side note, this is not a joke. Did not invent the can opener. That took another uh, 48 years. <laughs> Should have had a competition for that one. A lot of soldiers lost fingers as they were using their bayonets, which is what they did, to open the can. So there were other prizes. Uh, there was a prize for uh, large-scale hydraulic turbine, advanced the European textile industry at massive cost to India. Again, not defending it. The point is, what can we do when we're running the contests? Last one is uh, Lindbergh, who uh, competed for the $25,000 Raymond Ortega Prize. No one even tried for five years. Contests had extended. Companies didn't even want to lend their equipment or sponsor people because they didn't want the inevitable deaths to be associated with their products. And that's, in fact, what happened to most of the people who did try. Um, so that's why we don't know who the other competitors were. But it worked, massively expanded air transit and changed the world. Yes, Spanish Civil War, carpet bombing, evil, I get it. We've all flown on a plane, thank planes. So there's lots, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll just say that in any number of pro-social things, literacy, scientific exploration, helping children to learn, creating water out of thin air, literally, turning CO2 into products, and so much more, it is a helpful way to be able to change what we can do. Mo Ibrahim, who I mentioned earlier, he did this in a similar way. He, with his, the money that he earned from selling his company, he established the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, the world's most sophisticated statistical bureau to examine every aspect of life on the African continent's 54 countries in one territory. And his goal was to make sure that he could have a meaningful measure of when governance was at its best. And then he would incentivize it by offering a massive prize, bigger than the Nobel Peace Prize, to any retired within a span of three years, African president or prime minister who had done the most to transform his or her country for the better. So in these several areas of human life, the results were remarkable. They don't give away a prize every year because you've only got a three-year span of retirees. They have to have come to power democratically. So there's a small pool of potential contestants. But these are people who are leaders on a world scale that I doubt most leaders anywhere else would be able to uh, meet them. You might recognize some of the winners, including Nelson Mandela, but it's pro-social on a national scale. The real winners of the competition are actually uh, the people. Now, you might say, well, why do you have to incentivize national leaders to do their jobs? You know, if you are, are Bill Clinton, for instance, who leaves office, you get to have millions of dollars pouring your way for book contracts and speaking engagements and sitting on boards. Your life is set. And by Mo Ibrahim's uh, own description, uh, many African presidents are, are told, like, we'll call you a cab, and there's the door, and some of them have to fa fear that their own enemies, political enemies, could jail them. So that's a perfect opportunity to breed corruption, if you think that when you retire from office, either corruption or just don't leave office. So instead, you get people to massively transform their countries to the better, and the, their own legacy is they're going to have a population, among other things, that is going to be very grateful. So they're not going to face the same kind of recrimination. There's much more to read, you can find out about it. Many other prizes, uh, including this for these young women from Senegal who won the uh, Pan-African Robotics Competition in 2017. Um, you have competitions for refrigeration. Refrigeration is a major justice issue. Two billion people don't have refrigeration. You might say, so what, you can't have a cold Coke. No, you can't have cold medicine, which means you will die. All right, not to mention food. Without refrigeration, you can't have food security for anybody. So, Engineers Without Borders USA announced the Chill Challenge, in which organizations would work to create low-cost refrigeration opportunities. As you can see right here, there are many more uh, competitions than this, but they're for every area of life that can improve their standard of living. How are you going to magnify these contests? If you are running a contest, if your union, your house of worship, your NGO, your social justice group wants to do this, you don't need millions. You don't need, uh, you certainly don't need billions. For a few thousand dollars, let's say $10,000, you can have a $5,000 first prize, $3,000 second prize, $2,000 third prize. You could make a contest for some goal that needs solving in your community. It could be related to an app that could help people out, a product, a service, whatever else. In some cases, there'll be community groups who've already done this thing, but nobody outside their community knows about it. 
And then you could harness the power of social media. The contest could require people to vote on it collectively. In other words, you could magnify this so that all kinds of people get inspired to create these solutions and opportunities themselves. How are you going to fundraise it? All the usual ways. Don't have time to discuss it, but you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to end very briefly, and then we'll have some discussion with the discussion of um, digital frontiers and also with um, the Alberta Solidarity Fund. That's uh, Jane McGonigal. She's a games theorist, academic, and game designer. In her excellent book, Reality is Broken, um, in addition to discussing how games work, we will have a look at some of the social games or massively distributed public games. I don't mean MMOs like uh, World of Warcraft. I'm talking about games that you play in the real human space. One of them is, uh, it follows the rules of gaming, by the way, and I, I could explain that later, but Wikipedia, a massive global database, yes, with many, many flaws, many, many problems, all of the biases that can go into it, all of which are true of corporate encyclopedias and, and in any number of things, that give ordinary people from anywhere in the world with an internet op, uh, account the opportunity to contribute to information that other people need. Yes, again, highly flawed, but as it turns out, it's actually the best one we've got that is a publicly accessible, writable, editable record. So that's just one example. We can also look at uh, my heart map challenge. This was in Philadelphia. Uh, defibrillators across the city save lives. You know, CPR, which we should all learn, has a very slim chance of working, I'm sad to say. But these defibrillators are much more likely to save a life. I'm sure this building has one. People don't know where they are, so they don't use them. So they created an online game, essentially. Go find the, these, these units in everywhere and join them, add them to our digital map. And so the result was that uh, they had a massive public interest in this, and they uh, completed their map. Uh, more than 313 teams found these defibrillators in 500 buildings throughout Philadelphia, and some received monetary prizes. We thought, they said, most participants would be younger students, but many of them were over 40, and one prize winner was over 60. So much for the digital divide. Okay. There's hope for many of us in this room. One last one. It's called uh, Investigate Your MP's Expenses. We had our own Senate expense problem. For folks in the UK, uh, in collaboration with a software developer, uh, wanted to convert and condense all the scan forms and expenses of MPs into 458,832 searchable online documents. The results speak for themselves. Within 80 hours, 20,000 people analyzed more than 170,000 documents. The result proved each MP on average expensed twice their annual salary. 140,000 pounds of expenses versus a 60,000 pound salary. Or collectively, 88 million pounds. The result, 28 MPs resigned and said they wouldn't run again, and hundreds of MPs were ordered to repay over 1.12 million pounds, which is actually very small compared to what they took. The point is that if you wanted to do a project that was an anti-fascist project or some type of pro-social project to help people, these online means to assemble a large number of people, some of whom don't want to leave their house but can contribute to society at their keyboard, these are possible. You just have to study the models that exist. I will briefly say this, and this is about the uh, Quebec Solidarity Fund. Of all of our institutions, unions have the biggest resources. NGOs don't, come close. But unions have the power to be able to change society in multiple ways. And in Quebec, the labor-sponsored Solidarity Fund is generating jobs. At least that's also how the uh, International Labor Organization describes it. The goal of the Quebec Solidarity Fund is to invest in suitable companies and provide them with services to create, maintain, and safeguard jobs to support the training of workers to allow them to increase their influence on the economic development of Quebec, to stimulate Quebec's economy through strategic investments, and to foster awareness and encourage workers to save their retirement. I said at the beginning, like the Koch brothers, you know, who are evil and have a long game for manipulating society, but unions have enough economic uh, power, this fund in fact was uh, billions and billions of dollars to have a big impact on Quebec life. Not a perfect institution, it's as limited as the people who run it, there are problems and controversies in the history of the Quebec Solidarity Fund, but there's no reason why Albertan unions couldn't band together to invest their money into something that also, uh, is in the case of the Quebec Solidarity Fund, invests in communities, local business which generate jobs for people. It can do more to favor companies that are union-friendly places. In other words, it is a major option with funds that already exist because the unions already have the money. They just have to figure out how to use it more effectively. So 
I apologize for this large amount of uh, material and leaving very little time to talk, but obviously I was excited to share it with you. And uh, my goal was to actually give you things, some things that you can do individually and other things that you in your organization can do. And as I say, they are all on, uh, if you go to my uh, homepage, and then you'll be able to read these citations and figure out your own ideas and make them better than what I presented today. Thank you very much. There's this growing open data community in Edmonton that are taking all kinds of different data sets and then doing all kinds of things with them from mapping community pathways to uh, overdoses to other. Um, the AFL put out this map about uh, who donated to the UCP. I'm really curious to if you could expand upon bullet number five around the solidarity fund and how open data and, and how it's, it's now easier than ever for people to, to get this info and, and do it. And I can't, but I, I know there's lots of students every day who are learning how to. I know the AFL caught uh, a lot of flack for uh, exposing those donations, but I, I think it's important. Donations to a political cause are part of the public record. You get to decide as a consumer where you want to spend your money. And really, do you want to spend your money at a place that is actually trying to hurt you or your community or people you care about, or just people you don't even know who deserve not to be hurt? So we can do more of this, and if you have some links that you'd like to share with me, I'd be more than happy to post them on this page. I recently had a really bad accident. It was sort of a death accident. In the hospital, I realized that mostly being worked on by, it was at the Mazankowski, and it was all male, the team, and they were jerks. But of course, the women, the nurses were amazing. I've always tried to act out of um, like two things, like if I'm a, I question myself, like, are you acting out of love or are you acting out of fear? I think in general, from the beginning, women were sort of running the show. And then I think men realized that we can procreate with one of you. I think it brought a lot of fear. When you talk about different communities, ethnic communities, unions, businesses, whatever, I think that being the makeup industry works against us to keep us down, right? I'm not saying all males keep us down, because that's not true. But I think if women globally band together, we can make the world a better place faster. Like if you look at New Zealand, the women who are running the show, the country seem to do better. I just am curious about like how that could happen on a global level, if you have an opinion about it. Thank you for the question. And I mean, I have an opinion and you know, I, I in no way want to suggest that this is a definitive, exhaustive scientific examination of this, but I've been part of various movements. And I've seen, you know, political movements, uh, ethnocultural movements, and so forth, and union movement. And my depressing experience is that I'm amazed at how often people can turn out to be rats. But when I'm more sober-minded, I reflect, wait a second, but everybody else isn't a rat. So most people, most of the time, are either neutral or pretty good. This is sort of like the ideal group of people who they are going to be always just. It is true, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, Outstanding. Wish she were our prime minister. And many of my heroes, you know, people like Wangari Maathai, the Kenyan scientist and the feminist ecolog ecological um, organizer, and so forth, uh, and and many more that we could go into. But you know, there's uh, Truss and Danielle Smith and Margaret Thatcher and all the people in the Trump circles. So I guess my feeling is nobody is guaranteed to be awesome. And in fact, even if you were awesome, you might turn out to be bad later. In the 80s, those of us who had solidarity with Nicaragua, we were very impressed by Daniel Ortega. And probably most of us have changed our opinions of Daniel Ortega. He may have been guilty at that time as well, for all I know. But my point is simply that I don't think anybody is guaranteed to be terrific. But I do believe that feminism is of enormous, irreplaceable value to the liberation and upliftment of humanity. And so many of the things, I'm just gonna speak selfishly as a man, benefit me as a man because uh, of the awareness that men don't have to follow into a very narrow range of what it is to be a man or a human being. So it liberates my life to have more joy and more authentic relationships and friendships. Like basically what I'm saying is I don't want to watch football uh, and all the things that that goes with, right? I get to be who I am and I think that feminism is one of the things that helped to make it easier for a huge range of men to be themselves and hopefully to have real love in their lives and hopefully also to be better advocates for justice for, uh, for non-men. All right. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts and insights. And thank you all for coming this weekend. <laughs> Hope to see you all and many more of you 
next year, this time, this weekend.